Do you know what time it is? It's Supernatural Story Time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only Only in in the dark. dark. The Devil Thing. It all started with a pair of bloody footprints. The neighborhood I lived in as a child, which I'm not naming for paranoia's sake, was always much smaller than the rest. In a town filled with subdivisions almost large enough to have their own area codes, my measly eight-house cul-de-sac was merely a blip on the radar of suburbia. It had only one drawing point. A farm had been built in the woods behind the houses. It consisted of a small underground stable area where the horses were kept, a house built on top of the stables, and a one or two acres where the horses could roam on their own. The stables were almost never used, only a couple of weeks in the summer season, but there was always permanent residence in the house. Mean ones, too. Always used to get mad at us when we went to visit the horses. They were old, so I guess they didn't really remember what it was like to be a curious child. But this story... My first encounter with the spirit plaguing those stables occurred in the winter seasons, after the horses had been gone for quite some time. We had all our fun with them, petting them and such, but most of the time with them was making sure we didn't catch the eye of the nasty couple in the house. By the first weekend of July, the owners had taken them somewhere else, a stable in western Pennsylvania, I think. In fact, it was the first day of winter, and outside it certainly showed. It had snowed all the night before, leaving a fresh coat that was a delight to my fifth grade self. I thought of all I would do when I got home from school and what I would do over the winter break. As thoughts of sledding and snowball fights raced in my head, my mother handed me my bag lunch and sent me on my way. I started out into the chilly beyond, glad that my mom had made me wear my balaclava despite my protests. The snow fell gently and I could feel it hit the soft barrier protecting my face. It was a pleasant feeling. Winter has always been my favorite season and after having an unusually warm Thanksgiving, I thought it would never come. I started down the street for the bus stop, which stood at the mouth of the road, opening up into the county highway. That bus stop is gone now. For safety measures, the bus now stops at each individual house to ensure that each student boarded safely. It takes up more time. But I can't really complain, as I've been driving myself and my brother to school all year. Part of me wishes the bus stop had never been put there in the first place, because I never would have been launched into the nightmare I'm currently living. You see, the first encounter with the spirit haunting the stables occurred as I walked to the bus stop on that chilly winter morning. As I walked, noting which areas would be the best to build a snow fort in, I noticed a streak of red leading into the woods. It intrigued me, as most things often do when you're a kid. I figured, since I was already out early for the bus, I might as well check it out. As I approached it, I noticed it wasn't so much a streak. It was thick and spanned about eight inches at its widest point. It continued well into the woods, though it became less intense. Had I the time, I would have pursued it further, but I could hear the sound of other kids leaving their homes and didn't want to frighten them with the bloody trail. But even from there, I could see it continued into the stables, which was odd because their doors should not have been open at this time of year. I stared for a while, reasoning what creature could lurk in the dark depths of the stable, when suddenly I felt something grab my shoulder. I remember screaming, and I remember turning around so fast that I fell to the ground. But most of all, I remember how relieved I felt when I discovered that it was only my best friend Garrett trying to scare me. What you looking at, Aaron, he said. He didn't see the trail of blood yet. I know he would, but I did not tell him. I don't remember why. Maybe because I wanted to do something by myself for once. Because I wanted to find out what the creature dwelling in the stables was without his help. Subconsciously, that's probably why. But it might also have been because I was afraid. Being such a young kid, my first thought wasn't that a coyote or fox carrying the carcass of a freshly hunted rabbit, but rather that our humble neighborhood had suddenly fallen prey to a sinister beast. I didn't want to drag him into such a nightmarish possibility. Oh shit, that's blood, he said almost instantly. 
Watch your language, man, I said in response, my voice shaking. Now I was afraid, but it was mostly aftershocks from him scaring me. What do you think happened here? A murder? Don't be ridiculous. Maybe a bear? There's not any bears around here. But I saw one from my window this morning. You what? Suddenly, we could hear the bus getting to a halt at the mouth of the road. This brought a halt to our conversation, and by the time we ran to the end of the street to catch the bus, we both had forgotten about the trail of blood. But the conversation resumed again during computer class later in the day. We had computer science once a week to help us keep up with a technology-written age. Our computer sciences teacher, Mrs. Halliday, was not too keen about the curriculum, and thus let us spend our 30 minutes of class time creating PowerPoint presentations. However, we had to adhere to a certain topic, and the current topic was animals. Garrett and I, always fans of mysteries, chose to do cryptids instead of regular animals. I chose the Mothman, and he chose the Jersey Devil. About halfway through the class period, he turned to me and said, I don't think I saw a bear. I was confused for a moment, but then thought back to our conversation by the trail of blood. Then what do you think you saw, I asked. I think I saw a cryptid, he replied. What makes you think that? Because it looks almost exactly like this. He then turned the computer screen to me, which displayed a grotesque drawing of the Jersey Devil. You think you saw the Jersey Devil? Yeah. But we're not even in New Jersey. Well, I'm not saying I saw the Jersey Devil. Just the same kind of creature. And you thought it was a bear? Hey, it was early. I didn't have my glasses on. Part of me, the growing adult part of me, believed that he must have been seeing things and that he actually saw a coyote. But the other half of me, the dominant half, was intrigued. Where was it? Was it by where the blood was, I asked? No. Besides, my house isn't close enough to see over there. I saw it roaming through the woods, kind of aimlessly. It was huge. As big as the trees? Not that big, no, but I'd say like a foot and a half bigger than you and me. Do you think we could catch it? I definitely think we can. The creature never left either of our minds that entire day. When I got home from school, I ran directly to his house to prepare for our search. He laid the items out on the floor of his basement. Camera, super important. No one's going to believe us if we don't catch it on video. He said, displaying a video camera that must have been mediocre by today's standards. Then he held up two Swiss Army knives that he had borrowed from his father. If we ever get in a jam, he said, and happily lent us them. Then the most important part, a net. I'm still not quite sure how he thought he would catch the beast with just a net, but I digress. Ready? He asked me, and with firm confidence I replied, ready. We headed upstairs where his mom sat at the kitchen table reading a week-old copy of People magazine and drinking hot chocolate. And where do you think you're going, she asked, not looking up from her magazine. We're going out to play, he responded, obviously lying. What's all that stuff, she asked, pointing to the sack of stuff he had slung over his back. Garrett was a bad liar, but I physically could not do it. It took all my force not to tell her that we were headed off into the woods to catch a strange beast that could very easily maul us. Come on, open the bag. Carrot sighing, walked over to his mother and poured the inventory of the sack onto the table. She took one look and said, You're going out to play with Swiss army knives? And that was when I couldn't handle lying anymore. We're going out to search for the thing that left a trail of blood earlier this morning, I confessed, causing Garrett to shoot me a nasty look. Oh, the trail of blood? You mean the one down by the end of the street? Yeah, that one. Garrett responded. He was obviously ashamed of lying. It must have been a coyote capturing a rabbit. Garrett's mom was always the rational one. He saw it. It wasn't a coyote. It was something bigger. After saying this, I expected Garrett's mom to force us to stay inside, but she didn't. She just told us to be careful and not to talk to strangers, as if strangers were our biggest danger. By the time we stepped outside, it had stopped snowing. There was a strange calm, and for lack of a better phrase, it was calm before the storm. Only the storm would take years to brew, a storm that I intend to bring an end to very soon. 
but on that cold December day in 2006, we never could have known what awaited us. And without that hindsight, we approached the trail of blood, this time observing it closer than before. Get out the camera, I whispered to Garrett, trying to hide my voice from something, something unknown. He pulled out the camera and hit the red record button. Immediately, he began narrating. Unlike me, he wasn't afraid of what was in those woods. So this morning, my friend Aaron and I saw a strange figure in these woods. Say hi, Aaron. And now we find this. Holy shit, there's footprints in the blood. And he was right. There were footprints, but they were not human footprints. They were from an animal, but no animal I could recognize. They parted like hooves, but had claws on the end, much like a cat. The foot was scarred, a couple on the left and right sides and several converging in the middle. And at that moment, I became truly terrified. I had been afraid before, but never had I been that terrified. On the video recording, you can hear me let out an audible cry even though I don't remember doing so. Now let's follow the trail, Garrett said to the hypothetical audience on the other side of the camera. But I refused, simply letting the word no hoarsely exit my mouth. Garrett turned to me. Why not? he asked. And I said nothing, because I was so afraid, because all suspicion that I had been dealing with some hell beast was no longer suspicion. I knew I wasn't dealing with a coyote, and that made me afraid, because I knew that when I got to that stable and walked through the unusually ajar door, that something would be waiting for me, and it would pounce, and it would drag me away, and I would never be seen again. Garrett stared at me a second, and I stared back, but I wasn't really looking at him. I was looking at the woods, hoping that the beast wasn't staring back at me. He clicked the camera off. Okay, then, he said, and began walking into the woods. I didn't follow. Instead, I went home and locked my door and closed the blinds on my window. I was more afraid than I had ever been. In my mind, I thought of the beast knocking on my windows that night, and me, being a curious kid, opening up the blinds only to see it staring right back at me. And as I thought of that, there was a knock on the door. It scared me so badly that I audibly screamed, but not as I had screamed when Garrett scared me in the morning. This scream was real. It was propelled by actual fear. I hesitantly opened the door and was relieved to see Garrett there instead of some horse-like beast. But I'll never forget the way he looked. His eyes were wider than I had ever seen them, and my God, was he pale. Every single part of him was shaking, and he didn't get scared easily. I invited him in, obviously, and set him down in my living room. I tried to coax an answer out of him, but all he told me was to watch the videotape. I turned on the camcorder and began replaying the tape. It picked up where he left off. He was walking through the woods, following the trail of blood. He arrived at the stables, and like me, noted how odd it was that the door was open. It's not usually open this time of year, he said, obviously starting to become quite frightened. But he pushed on into the stable. It was pitch black, which should have been a sign for him to turn back, but he pushed on anyways. I could see him approach a small string connecting to a light bulb on the ceiling, but he could not see it. He bumped into it and jumped, but discovered where he was, and he pulled it. But there was no doubt he wished he had never pulled it. The light came on, dimly lighting the stables. In the corner was something nightmarish. It was, in fact, a dead rabbit that the creature had pulled into the stables. But that hadn't been the only one. There were dozens stacked there, halfway to the ceiling, which admittedly wasn't too high. Oh my God, whispered Garrett on the videotape. Suddenly there was a sound of footsteps. Not human, but heavy like them. But they moved too fast to come from man. That was when Garrett booked it out of there. He flew out of the stables faster than anyone I've ever seen, which was surprising as he was more on the chubby side. I could hear it pursuing him, and halfway through the forest he stopped recording. Now I looked over at him, the real Garrett, and saw that he was crying. I'd never seen him cry before, and I haven't seen him since. All I could manage to say was, did you get a good look at it? He croaked. Only a little bit, and in that moment, I looked upon the face of the devil. I said nothing else, 
We never went looking for the beast again, neither him nor I. At least, not for a couple of years. It was coming closer. College is a peculiar time of your life. Having fun almost always outweighs your responsibilities. Hence why sometimes one must go out of their way to pass the class. And so one day I had to attend extracurricular activities at my university late in the afternoon. Surprisingly enough, they weren't too demanding, and I was soon going to be able to pass it, despite my disappointing exam results. On my last meeting at the university, the professor had given me the green light, and so I left the building in good spirits. You see, my university, despite its great reputation, was placed in the middle of nowhere. Or so you could say, it was not too far out of town, but far enough that the shortest path to my home was some forest path. It wasn't a hiking path or anything, just a small, curvy, steep path over a small hill that led to the town. Of course, you could always take the road, but I've always taken great pleasure in lonely afternoon walks, even more so in the fall. I have traversed this path many times, even late in the afternoon, but today the meeting was longer due to the announcement of finishing grades, so it was almost night time. And to top it all, it was also very foggy, but that isn't a rarity in my town, so I've grown pretty used to it. After I smoked a cigarette with some of my schoolmates in front of the college, I said goodbye and went home. While walking, I admired the environment. The fog was thick. The weather, however, wasn't all that cold. But the humidity today was quite something, so breathing wasn't such a mundane task as it usually is. Street lights looked like distant stars or UFOs of some sorts. You couldn't see their poles due to the fog. I could hear the soothing sound of the small creek next to the road flowing carelessly down the stream. There were no animals nor people in sight. I was all alone and I liked it. And after a few more steps, I turned from the small sidewalk into the forest. The forest was silent and dark. The fog covered the higher parts of the hill, but it was still somewhat visible due to the full moon. Basking in the moonlight, I walked through the forest, my footsteps being the only sound heard throughout the forest. Then I heard something. It was a crackle, like if someone or something had stepped on a dry branch. I dismissed it as something not too peculiar, as that sound can also be made by some pine cones falling on dry leaves, or some animal breaking twigs. After all, this is a forest. Animals are sure to reside in it. But I stepped up my pace a tiny bit because something like that makes you feel uneasy. Being all alone in the middle of the forest only worsens the situation. So I walked on and on, approaching the halfway mark, which was a steep rise towards the top of the hill. I never was much of a hiking fan, but I've grown used to this particular slope. Suddenly I heard a cracking sound. Not a tiny crack like before, it was a loud one, as if a bigger animal stepped on a big branch. I quickly looked behind me. There was nothing in sight. Not sure if that made me more anxious or if it lessened the anxiety slowly building in me. Soon I was at the top and I quickly rushed down without even taking a look around myself to see the forest dimly lit by the moonlight distorted by the fog. Although I'm sure this is quite a sight, that was not the appropriate time to sightsee. I was sure the sound I heard was made by some sort of a deer stepping somewhere and I also really hoped it wasn't a bear that made that sound. The last thing I wanted was to be mauled by a bear right after working my ass off to pass a class. When the steepest part of the downward slopes was behind me, I had to take a breather. I looked at the bigger hill behind the one I just hiked. I could not see its top. The fog had grown thicker and it looked like it was cutting the hill in half. Quite an eerie sight. After a few moments I had to move. It was growing late and I was still quite anxious. Then I heard a sound. Not a crackle. It was the sound of somewhat bigger rock hitting a tree stump. Which animal on earth could possibly throw such rocks at trees? Something wasn't right, and I felt it on the back of my neck. I picked up my pace and walked, thinking about nothing else than the next step. The path was also quite flat, so I could go even faster, but the clumsy me tripped over a root in the ground. I quickly stood up, bent down a bit to tie my now untied shoe. I felt the breeze behind me. It wasn't a wind breeze. It was the kind of a breeze that you feel when something passes you really fast. 
I knew something just passed behind me. I didn't know why, but I just did. I looked around in fright. I saw nothing which creeped me out even more. How was there nothing here? What the hell just passed by me then? I started running. I didn't care that this path wasn't good for running. And so I ran through the thick fog, looking at the ground, avoiding every root by jumping over it. I've never ran so fast in my life. It was probably the adrenaline since I felt like I was in mortal danger. I finally arrived out of the forest to a well-lit street. I could finally take a moment to breathe, but as I did that, I heard something whisper my name. Not the silent whisper. It was like somebody screamed my name while whispering. I was shaking, and as I turned around, I saw something in the darkness of the forest. Two lights, glowing weakly, but just strong enough to see them through the fog. But their shape wasn't that of a flashlight, but more like an eye. Not a human one, more like a wolf. Trembling in horror, I started running again. I had to get far away from this forest. There was nothing good waiting for me there. I ran into my town and I felt at ease. All the cars and people around me, all the lights, even the fog was way thinner here than in the forest. I lit a cigarette and started walking instead of running. I was pale, like I had just seen a monster, and who knows, maybe I did. People looked at me in a strange way. I couldn't blame them, though, because I looked damn terrible. Soon I arrived home. I had never felt so safe in my life. I locked the door twice, checked every door and closet due to how paranoid I was. Nothing was there. I felt relieved and opened a can of beer to celebrate me passing the class and perhaps to celebrate being alive after that nightmarish hike. I began frantically searching the internet for any proof of werewolves or other cryptids in my area. Of course I found nothing since everybody dismissed tales of supernatural as fake. I knew my story wasn't fake and I decided to never set foot in that damn forest ever again. It was time to get a bike and take the road to my university. The safe, well-lit road. I looked at some videos to help ease my mind, but it didn't help much. I had to take a sleeping pill to try and fall asleep. I also locked the door of my room, because one can never take too many safety precautions. I could feel the pill slowly taking on over, and I began to drift away. Suddenly, I felt uneasy, like something was watching me through the window. I immediately stood up and went to the window. As expected, there was nothing there, mainly because I live on the third floor. I dismissed it as paranoia and due stress, as I've had quite a stressful walk home, but on the other hand, I couldn't get it out of my head. What if something was there, but it was on the wall above my window? I was panicking, so I had to calm myself down and try to fall asleep again. I finally fell asleep, and I had vivid nightmares about the thing stalking me. It was not a pleasant experience, to say the least. I woke up covered in sweat. I shook my head to snap out of the delirium that I had just experienced. When I came to my senses, I giggled nervously. I felt very uncomfortable with the fact that I was living alone in my apartment, which did not help either. There was nobody there for me to calm me down to assure me that everything was going to be okay. I was all alone with my mind that was ravaging like a hurricane. Nothing made much sense anymore. I looked at the clock next to my bed. The time was 2.17 in the morning. I didn't get much sleep and I was not going to get much anyway, so I decided to read a book to distract my mind. Completely immersed in the story, I started to forget about the nightmarish journey that had happened only a few hours earlier. Then I heard a knock. No, that sound was not a knock. More of a slam into my window. Like the sound birds make when they run into it, but there were no birds. Winter was coming, and they had migrated to warmer places. I grew even more paranoid. What just slammed into my window? I decided to go and take a look. At that time, I'd much gladly see someone throwing bricks at my window. Hell, even pointing a gun at me than what I've seen, which was nothing. The thing that just scared the living hell out of me was nowhere to be seen. I was 100% sure it was the monster. Sounds irrational, but my mind was sure of it. I went back to bed shivering. I didn't know who to call. Who would even believe such a preposterous thing? Everybody would have dismissed it as the wind, 
but I was sure that wasn't the case. Not sure why I felt the way I did. Thump. I heard that sound coming from the hallway. Something just bumped into my window again. The door to my room was directly opposite the hallway window, so I saw moonlight shine disappear for just a moment. Something had passed my window. There was no denying it. Something literally passed my window on the third floor. What kind of a creature is big enough to blacken your whole window? Yet it can climb walls so proficiently or fly? I grabbed my pillow and squeezed it next to myself. I was numb, holding the pillow so tight I almost tore it open. Suddenly I heard my window being torn off. Not being broken, literally being torn off the hinges. It fell on the ground and made a loud noise that surely woke up half the building. Then something jumped inside of my hallway. The hardwood floor creak, creak upon creak, I could feel this creature coming closer. I muffled my mouth with a pillow, hoping that the creature wouldn't notice my presence. I could hear it putting its head on the door and breathing heavily, like it had just run a marathon. Then it started whispering something incomprehensible. It wasn't a language I'd ever heard of. It sounded more like animal sounds mixed with gibberish. It turned around and went somewhere else in my apartment. I presumed it was a kitchen. I heard it making a ruckus there. Drawers were being torn out. All the forks and knives were being thrown around. It even started breaking glasses, throwing them all over the place. It was searching for something. Me, I started crying in sheer terror. This thing was coming for me. It was only a matter of time before it found me. Then it suddenly stopped wreaking havoc upon my kitchen. My cries were probably a tad bit too loud, so I quickly but silently hid under my bed. I heard the hallway floor creak, which meant it was in the hallway again. It made slow, long steps as if it was mocking me, trying to make me even more nervous. It came to the door once again, but this time it started sniffing around. I could see the doorknob being jerked around. Isn't that kind of funny? My impending doom could not even turn a doorknob. I was shaking. Tears were running down my face. I started thinking of all my friends, my family. What will they know of this? What will be marked as my cause of death? I was mad. Why did I even sign up to this college? Why did I get an apartment on the third story? I couldn't even jump out of the window. That meant almost sure death. Hiding underneath my bed, I at least had a glimmer of hope left that I wouldn't be discovered. Well, that is what I was clinging to. The creature roared and started pounding at the door. It knew I was here. Perhaps while immersed in my thoughts, I made sounds that ensured that thing I was here. The door wasn't going to hold on much longer. I was as pale as a wall. As the door was bulging more and more, I could see glimpses of the creature, but not enough to actually describe it. After what seemed like an eternity, the door just fell over. I could now finally see it in its full, grotesque glory. The sheer sight of it was making me feel sick and scared. It didn't look like anything I've ever seen in my life. It was truly indescribable. The worst part was the smell. Like a walking corpse just entered my room. It began sniffing. It wanted to find me. I was numb by fear. I couldn't even move an inch. Or else I may have just died. It was slowly moving closer to the bed. I could see its feet right in front of my face. Slowly it kneeled down and began sniffing around. It stopped sniffing right in front of my face. Finally we met face to face. I could feel it staring at me. Just staring and staring. Then the doorbell rang. It startled the creature so much it ran away through the window. I rushed to open the door as soon as I was sure that the creature had left. At the door was my neighbor, an old lady who had always been kind to me. When she saw what happened to the place, she called the police immediately and reported a burglary. I could tell nobody what I'd seen, so I went with the burglary story. The burglar was never found. I got paid insurance money and had to take a year off from college. And now here I am. Quite a few years later, living in a bigger apartment with my future wife, working for a big company. The paycheck is also really great. I haven't told anybody of my encounter. Not like anybody would believe me anyways. I am laying next to my beautiful girlfriend 
who is already asleep, preparing myself to fall asleep as well. Then suddenly, thump. I hear coming from the window. <laughs>